The title of Fostering Diverse Technological Futures in the Green Economy is really following on from work that has been carried out uh, as part of this project that we've been running for the last four years, which Melissa already referred to. Innovation, Sustainability, Development, the New Manifesto. And what we called for in the document the New Manifesto, and what we shared with colleagues around the world as part of that project, was uh, a new global politics for innovation. <coughs> The way that we described that politics was that it needed to focus more and pay more attention to what we called the 3D agenda of innovation. The first D was the focus not on the rate and scale of innovation, but on the directions in which innovation unfolds. The second D referred to distribution and more equitable distribution of the costs, benefits and risks associated with those innovation trajectories. And the third D which is the focus of today really, is diversity. Recognizing the importance and the value of fostering diverse innovation approaches to sustainable development challenges. And what I'm going to do is just introduce conceptually uh, how we have understood those three Ds before handing over to our colleagues uh, from around the world to illustrate how some of the, um, their activities have fostered this kind of diversity. If we imagine technologies uh, evolving along trajectories, this is a, a lot of the work from innovation studies is really focused on this topic. Um, we can, we can uh, illustrate this using this space of technological possibilities, which you see on the right, and follow the technology and their trajectories through time. And scholars studying innovation have found that a number of different forces act to constrain innovation trajectories through sci by scientific possibilities, through technical convergence, um, the market um, working towards equilibrium, and importantly through social, that's behavioural, as, you know, the behaviours of users, and also political processes. So Lieber Baker's work on bicycles, for example, showed how a number of diverse models or inventions or um, types of bicycles actually converge down to what he termed the safety bicycle. Taking this understanding of how innovation emerges, the Step Centre would like to turn it on its head and really think not about convergence but about where we are now and how possible innovation trajectories could emerge. And there's been a lot of work in innovation studies that has also looked at this. And much of that work illustrates how pathways follow, um, have momentum, certain technological systems have momentum and lead us down specific technological trajectories to the expense of others. So the examples of the QWERTY keyboard originally designed to slow typists down has actually become locked in as a result of user behaviours and corporate strategies that have actually left us with a similar configuration of keys and to the present day. Illustrating that these forces of lock-in can actually work to the detriment uh, either of uh, effective technologies for users but indeed in the, um, in the case of more sustainable technological trajectories. And when it comes to sustainability, these technological systems as we see them in urban transport or especially in centralised energy um, really can lock out some of the more sustainable options, for example, more distributed renewable forms of low carbon energy generation. And so the politics of direction, this first D, we see as really underlying many of the debates around existing and emerging technologies in the current um, day. Alongside those politics of direction, really emerge a consideration of the distribution of benefits, costs and risks from those different trajectories. And we ask that within the current global politics, closure on these particular paths and locking to these paths often reflects current incumbent interests and excludes others. And so therefore some of the negative impacts of these technological changes can uh, bear most acutely on the more marginalised and groups which don't have an input to those uh, debates. And so therefore the democratisation of these directions is key in, um, in this session and in, in our arguments today. 
But lastly, democratization along individual pathways we recognize um, is unlikely to occur, is unlikely to really serve the needs, the very diverse needs of communities around the world. And so therefore, we need to recognize the importance of diversity in these technological trajectories. Diversity not only can act to mitigate these forces of blocking and momentum, and enable us to continue innovating across multiple different frontiers of knowledge, not only in science and technology, but also um, non-scientific uh, forms of knowledge. It also allows us to hedge against ignorance, whether that's in environmental dyna dynamics, which we've been speaking about a lot over the last two days, but also technological and social dynamics, which we are um, less and less able to predict. And then lastly, diversity in technological trajectories and fostering this kind of diversity <coughs> allows us to accommodate the plurality of values around sustainable development, which are evident in international forums such as this, and even more evident when we step outside the confines of this conference. So today we're going to be talking about different modes of fostering this diversity, whether it's through technology assessment, whether it's to, through market mechanisms that identify needs of users, uh, whether it's through participatory te technology development, or through uh, translating experiences and experiments at local levels towards more systemic and transformative change. And at that point, I'll hand over to our um, other panel members, starting with Dinesh. Friends, I come from India. Uh, I have been hearing for the last uh, two days that the bottom has fallen out. Uh, you know, with the people who have concern for climate change. Uh, in fact, uh, if I look at the Indian experience, and particularly the experience that I'm going to relate, which relates to the millions of people uh, uh, in India, uh, that is uh, the case with people who actually conduct agriculture, the peasants, the agricultural workers, who actually undertake agrarian production, and they constitute more than 77% of the Indian people, and they are the people, actually. And if you look at them, many of them over the last two decades have been actually committing suicide. Two million people have committed, farmers have committed suicide during the period of the last two decades. In fact, if you look at that particular kind of figure, it is staggering as well. How come it has happened and how the people responded to it? Yeah, there have been protests. But there have been simultaneously constructive actions as well. People have been willing to collaborate with those scientists who want to actually break with the older paradigms and open up diverse technological pathways. I'll give you an example of the case study of Andhra Pradesh. Andhra Pradesh is uh, part of the central South India. Actually, this is the place where exactly a lot of suicides were taking place, particularly with the farmers who were doing cotton, chili, many of the cotton uh, cash crops. And it's precisely here also Monsanto introduced the beating cotton. It's precisely in this particular area we opened a new pathway, that is the agroecological farming systems approaches. Not the whole approach to begin with. We started with what we call non-pesticide management. Meaning, making villages free of chemical pesticides altogether. Not, you don't need to use chemical pesticides to protect your crop. Now, farmers, women form self-help groups. They have a huge amount of knowledge which existed with them for centuries together. And they produce a number of innovations on that particular basis while collaborating with the farmers, uh, with the scientists who have been actually advocating agroecological farming system, which is a very comprehensive approach actually to uh, you know, a, a changing the high external input system of agriculture and not merely shifting inputs that happens in organic. Here, this particular approach got triggered not because of climate change. It got triggered because people were bothered about health concerns. It's not necessarily that they look for financial incentives. It was good incentive if they actually could overcome even the, uh, the every second household in a place like Punjab, which I come from, and not Andhra Pradesh. Uh, in Mal in Malay Kotla region, the region which actually grows cotton and uses how heavy amount of chemical pesticides, actually has a, a, a cancer patient in every second house. 
In fact, the train starts in the morning from Batinda in that particular region, which is called a cancer train, cancer patient's train. That is the kind of concern which has motivated people when they could combine themselves with committed scientists who wanted to open a new technological pathway. So the bottom hasn't fallen out. The bottom is actually participating in changing the direction of science and technological effort and innovation effort. But of course there are many obstacles on the path in building this particular pathway. Many of the farmers are tenant farmers. In fact, if you want to go to the next step of agroecological farming, you need to change the property relations in agriculture. Then only longer term investments would come in. Because agroecological approach means integration, diversification, and intensification in a manner that you combine aquaculture, you need uh, silviculture, you need uh, animal crop and animal put together, again combined, which, is, which you actually separated during the high external put system of agriculture. Here, this particular new pathway designed all kinds of challenges to be overcome. Property relations is one I mentioned. Agreement on agriculture, in fact, which we signed at the behest of the transnational business, in fact, is coming in the way. Because the output, but that also becomes an opportunity. The output is actually now becoming more risky. Because if you depend on one crop, and if you do not have multiple crops, your risk is going to be much higher. So actually there's an opportunity as a result to go for multiple cropping and multiple farming systems to be integrated, what's called the multi-story agriculture. Five, six stories agriculture within this not simple flat agriculture. So here you actually introduce this particular innovation triggered up by the health concerns. Women participated, farmers participated, and if you can overcome the obstacles, they will go from the non-pesticide management to a totally new system and you shown it, it's happening. And we even have influenced the Department of Science and Technology. From experiment, we have gone to the niche. It's not 1,40,000 hectares that you are affecting. You are affecting, in fact, finding the policies. <coughs> Some people say, by last minute. I would in, uh, not actually daydream that this means that we have arrived, or the agroecological farming has arrived. In fact, a number of obstacles which need to be overcome would require not only a new global politics, of course a new global politics. If agribusiness wants to push the bi agribiotech and create a reserve army as far as is concerned for the gains that it wants to make, the alternate politics would be required both at the international level as well as the national level. The farm, some of the richer farmers declared what is called the crop holiday in this particular region. Because, oh, because they said that agriculture is so unremunerative and so on, etc. And they, get, they were getting scared of the fact that the kind of systems which the poor peasants, the smaller landless laborers, in fact are getting empowered with is going to become a threat to them. And as a result, they come back with vengeance as far as it's concerned to declare a raw politics. So a new politics with the social movements, agrarian movements, with technologies, with the way science would be done, is required and there is a hope because it can be done. We have shown it in a number of experiments. I do not have time. I could have gone in another area as how we have done it. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked to um, talk basically on experiences that we have had um, at practical action in Southern Africa. But I really just want to say one, some, a few statistics that I think you uh, have heard already, um, which you probably know, that 2.7 billion people in the world sadly cook on, eight, on open fires. Okay, 2.7 billion. And I need to just tell you that 80% of the 12.7 million people in Zimbabwe cook on open fires. So I think we contribute certainly to the 2.7 billion uh, in a big way. While the MDG1C talk in terms of halving uh, the population <coughs> suffering from food insecurity, I need to say that 50% today, in fact, uh, uh, last three years, 75% of Zimbabwe is food insecure. And this year is no better, as we have actually um, a terrible drought. So what needs to be done? Water, um, again, once again, um, we know that the 
Millennium Development Goals targets are to half by 2015 uh, people with, um, to, rather to half uh, people with access uh, to clean water um, by 2015. Now, when you look at economies of Zimbabwe, um, it is probably obvious that we will never actually reach uh, that goal. So what needs to be done is probably concerted effort of technologies, uh, not only within the country, but certainly by developed countries. Um, but we are also aware that technologies have um, actually been introduced in, in, in developing countries, particularly in Zimbabwe, for the last 50 years. We've done some sort of analysis to see what benefits those technologies have given to the population of Zimbabwe. Um, and I think some other cultures were really shocked to say, I think we seem to have gone backwards. This despite quadrupling number of NGOs that operate in the country, <coughs> knowledge access via internet and via any other most of the sources now available electronically and otherwise, we thought as practical action that something has to be done right if this is to be corrected. Practical action developed a model called CBA, which is community-based approaches. <coughs> Within that, there are various technologies that are actually shared um, with the communities and scientists, including other stakeholders. Notably, in 2006, um, together with colleagues from DEMOS um, and my colleague, Devin who is there, we mounted what we refer to as nano dialogues in Harare. The idea was to see how nanotechnology could assist in halving the number of people um, not accessing clean water, at least by 2015. We opened up the debates not only to the communities that were identified as uh, most affected, and this is one peri-urban community and one rural community. We opened this debate to scientists, who we believe will certainly have an interest in nanotechnology, and also policymakers um, and other water stakeholders like non-governmental organizations. A three-day workshop started with um, us presenting the problem of water and not necessarily focusing on another technology that we believe would actually be the silver bullet to the problem of water quality. For two days, the organizers did not mention nanotechnology. And what came out of the stakeholders was very interesting. With social aspects, outputs, we were told certainly the problem, quality of water was not a problem. The problem is its availability the way it is. Responsibility to fetch water was women and girls, so we need to ensure that we have containers that these people are able to carry. We were told of the distance um, where the water would be, um, and we were told about what technologies were introduced, particularly Italian and German technologies were cited, which had been introduced two years earlier, with no manuals in English, so when they broke down, no one knew how to fix them. When on the third day we introduced nanotechnology, we thought we would see excitement, as we were reading excitement actually in the West. But the opposite was true. One, there were fears, certainly by the communities, consumers themselves, of yet another technology that would be difficult to handle and manage. The scientists were worried more about the safety of the technology. They also wanted to know whether they could actually use the nanoparticles for other applications. They wanted to know who would manage uh, this. Is it a school plant or is it a government purification plant and who will be in charge? They wanted to know the disposal of some of these technologies. They wanted to know the degree of dependence on the Western best technologies. At the end of the third day, we concluded, certainly, that nanotechnology was not really part of the problem. And instead, what we really, I think, uh, brought out of the communities is issues that were then and are still being debated at large by all stakeholders that, that, that attended. 
Another example that I really want just to, 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 to uh, bring to your attention is one that we call uh, spreading knowledge in local voices um, and in local languages. Uh, this realizes again from Fritz Schumacher, uh, the founder of ITDG, the next collection, which says that the gift of material um, makes people dependent, but the gift of knowledge uh, frees them. Uh, we have tended now to package, or we do package knowledge on literally all application of our project, in particular water, agriculture, health, environment issues in local voices and languages. And this we have used participatory methods in the community. So the communities actually own that knowledge. And it comes from the communities, from the experts, and fused with indigenous knowledge, where now knowledge, we can say, belongs to the communities. For the last uh, four years, this technology has taken off, and this is, has now come <coughs> to be the preferred mode of um, the knowledge exchange. Finally, really I just want to say that collaborative effort, I think, in all scientific work that takes place in terms of technology needs to be done, without which I think uh, the communities and the people we serve would not know which voice to listen to. And most importantly, I think collaboration that includes the poor uh, and marginalized communities, again, transfers uh, the knowledge to them and they will accept and of course you can be assured of innovation. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for having invited me. And also I feel very much in line with the manifesto, with the three of uh, these that were presented by Elie <coughs> and Melissa. So what I am going to do briefly is to say a few words about participatory research. And so this research, what is done between scientists and non-scientists, and the non-scientists for us are uh, non-for-profit actors coming from civil society. Uh, I will very briefly present you the national program of participatory <coughs> research we have in France, and to come to agriculture, the example of participatory plant breeding we were working on uh, during the last uh, years. So maybe just a few words why it is important to have programs which support participatory research um, and I will just stick to the second point. So the research and innovation that is prioritized and funded today depends largely on underlying principles and values, how it is governed, by whom, and who does participate. And I think also the conference today uh, is, a, is a place where we should discuss uh, these questions. So it is a new, a new kind of um, a new popular paradigm, research with non-research actors, it has a huge potential, but it's not yet enough uh, used because it still remains marginalized. We have also to, to consider that uh, civil society organizations are already acting on science and technology since a long time, either as watchdogs uh, or either as uh, partners in different domains, be it health, environment, agriculture, transport, energy, and so on. So we can speak here uh, about the scientific third sector. So just to say, we have research activities in these traditional places that are public research labs and private research labs. And now we have this emerging sector, emerging during the last decades, that comes into research, innovation, and development, and uh, what is the civil society. So what is so very interesting, if we really go seriously into participatory research that explores alternative socio-technological futures, it opens up new directions of research, think about the application of the precautionary principle, for instance, we have never so much research in ecotoxicology, pushed by all the questions, what came also from civil society actors. Participatory research goes beyond mainstream power ranks and frames which dominate public and private research institutions. And here we can partly think about a certain locked-in situation, how research questions are formalized. I'm very self a former molecular biologist and geneticist, so I have also a certain idea about this. And, and of course, it contributes to rethink, and I think this is also the conference is also calling us to do this to rethink research, innovation, and direction of progress and the other underlying values. So we have to reconsider notions that are not at all natural. So what about growth, competitiveness, strengthening the industry? Or maybe should we think rather about, uh, about the prosperity rather than about growth? 
What is the relation between science and solidarity? Is there one? What about social and environmental justice? Melissa uh, mentioned it already. And sustainable innovation. So we have since uh, four years now uh, a national program what, is, what was launched by the French Ministry of uh, Ecology. What is very interesting then in the political process to see it was the Ministry of Ecology what launched a participatory research program and not the Ministry of, of Research because we had this large public consultation on environment in France in 2007. And it's probably also linked to the fact that the Ministry of Ecology is already used to work with NGOs, what is almost not the case for the uh, Ministry of Research in France, and I think not only in France. So I will skip this to come to the uh, example of participatory plant breeding, and of course I'm, I'm not telling you uh, new things when I say, okay, we have these large-scale genetically uniform monocultures in, uh, in, in Europe, we have high pressure from seeds industry, and most farmers do not have seeds anymore. Uh, we have res registration regulation limits uh, for varieties uh, adapted in organic agricultures, and we see so the emergence of new models of involving farmers in the process of breeding and research. So what is participatory plant breeding? It is a common work between peasants and the farmers, they choose themselves to call them peasants, because very often they have only very small farms. So, so it is work between peasants, scientists, all kinds of associations, consumers, food processors, retailers, to create new varieties. Uh, it is a response to the need of new varieties for low input in organic agriculture, not covered by modern industrial breeding. Uh, just to remind you that the, the industrial breeding, as we know it from after the Second World War, war on, suc succeeded in separating the different stages. You know, we have the conservation, where we have now big banks, we have the breeding, with the instations or laboratory, and we have the production in the farms, but the farmers do not have the seeds anymore, so they have to buy them on the market, and they do not do any more breeding uh, by themselves. So participatory plant breeding is all putting again together as a continual process in the farmer's fields, where we have the dynamic, dynamic management of cultivated uh, agricultural biodiversity, the breeding of new varieties, and the agricultural production. So, of course, the farmer has to live from what comes from his field, but he's also interested in, in going on. And so they use land races and historical varieties. And just to remind you, when we eat today bread, so it mainly comes from a very few wheat varieties that are still used. Uh, but uh, there exists uh, thousands and thousands of wheat varieties all over the world. And they are adapted locally, and they are so different. So, and you see these uh, fields with these different uh, varieties, you know, they have all colors and all sides, then you really understand what means the word biodiversity. And of course they try to obtain varieties that match the farmer's practices and that are adapted to the local climate and to the local territory. So what is interesting about these processes, which, which are very different, you know, I mean, they come from so different cultures, the scientists and the peasants, you know, and they don't have the same objectives, and they don't have the same time scales, and they don't have the same words and the same language. And so it's a process of co-construction of the methodology for sustainable plant management. So they have to, to work together all the time, and from the very beginning of the project up to the very end, and as you know, in plant breeding, it takes a long time. It's, uh, it's a several years process. And so the output is production of locally adapted varieties. So why does this matter? Um, if you take it for serious, then you see it's a question of food security, it's local food production for local markets, for local people, increased crop efficiency. It's about poor quality. And uh, just to remind me, we speak about our daily uh, Alimentation, so it's fodder, it's cabbage, tomatoes, beans, sunflowers, mice, everything you can imagine. It's about resource management, energy saving. You don't use any more uh, chemical fertilizers. It's about health for consumers, for farmers, but also for the soils and for the ecosystems. Uh, resilience, the right of the farmers to use their own seeds. We have right now a, a, a very strong fight somehow in France where the, where the peasants try to. to uh, Protect their the right to uh, to grow their own uh, varieties to, to create.
get their own seats and to sell them. And of course, uh, not to, to, uh, to forget, uh, right now we are discussing the new uh, research uh, program on the European level, and of course, uh, agricultural research is one of the main points. And so just uh, here we could uh, think we are in Mexico. So, that's it. It's not so easy to know uh, or, and to learn about that from, from Latin America. Uh, what I'm going to show you is um, a research we are doing, in, especially in Argentina and Brazil, about grassroots innovation movements. As what Watson said on Sunday, grassroots uh, innovation can play a role in sustainable societies and green economies. But they also can play a role in democratizing science and technology policies. And I think that is, is, a, is a big question for us. The thing is how to how we can understand that, how we can improve this practice of rational innovation. And I think that my presentation was trying to address that question. Grassroots innovation in, in Latin America, especially in Argentina and Brazil. They emphasize the role of in technology and innovation in social uh, development, and, but also in transformation, transformation of social practices. Uh, they are trying to mobilize different actors like universities, public R&D labs, policy makers. Um, from 2000 on, there is a huge network in Brazil. It's called Social Technology Network, supported by uh, big donors like Petrobras, Banco do Brasil, Caixa Económica Federal, Cas more or less 800 members. In Argentina, there is no such network. We are trying to build up one. It's called uh, Red, uh, Social Technology Network in Argentina. Uh, but there are over 100 experiences in public labs, NGOs, uh, and in public, big public institutions like INTA, INTI, and uh, national universities. Um, on these cases, we run a series of case studies on, on, on different sectors, social housing, food production, agricultural production, renewable energies, and also in health. Um, uh, the results are very, it's, 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 they show a tendency. See, it's not an exhaustive research, um, but I want to focus on that, on that tendency, because I think there is a problem or some difficulties that we need to address if we want to improve grassroots innovation. And it related, it's related with how these public labs treat poverty alleviation and what kind of solutions they develop in order to attack poverty alleviation. They usually think in Poor, poor problem as a single problem, like lake, lack of water, for example. And they develop a single solution, like a water pump. Um, what remains is if you provide a poor community with a water pump, what's going to happen with food production, for example? And if they lack energy, the water pump is not going to help at all. So there are some difficulties related with this single technological solution approach. Uh, that's it, it is, of course, related with technological determinism. Uh, they can pro produce unwanted or unexpected effects. Uh, and they may be adequate in the short term, but this is not going to lead to social transformation. And I think that, or my concern there, is that if you produce technology for the poor and technology for big business, you are crystallizing differences you are risking to deepen the uh, two-sector economy. So the challenge is how to develop social technical systems that include active user participation, long-term adequacy, negotiation of knowledge between indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. And of course, that is not an easy task. I think that 
at the same time, this social technological system has to be built not just for the poor, but for everyone. I mean, water scarcity is not just a problem of the poor population. Energy uh, is not the problem just of the poor population. If you focus the problem on single technological solutions, we are going to uh, have a much bigger problem in, long, in the long term. So, what we are trying to do uh, with the Social Technology Network and the Argentinian Network for social te the Technology for Social Inclusion is capacity building uh, with different actors, uh, trying to plan new strategies for development, trying to design new kind of artifact, and especially trying to design that in a social technological system way. Let's say, when you are attacking the water scarcity problem, you also have to provide energy to this community, and you have to provide water not just for um, family consumption, but for food production. And that's, it's, it's, it's a new way of designing artifacts that we are trying to develop. And also have to include negotiation of knowledge. How to negotiate that knowledge? It's, it's not an easy task, and we are learning to do so. But I think we, we need to do more research on that and try to develop new systems to achieve that. <coughs> Um, finally, if this is not just uh, an issue of developing technologies or new technological system, if you want to improve grassroots participation in science and technology policy, you have to change the science and technology innovation policy. You have to challenge the mainstream science and technology agenda. Uh, in Latin America in particular, science and technology agenda are focused on rent-seeking fields. So uh, the bulk of the small budgets for science and technology led to it, 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 it profit by big companies, like biotechnological companies, energy companies. And the amount of budget uh, to, towards grassroots innovation is very tiny. It's around 1% or 2% international in Brazil. So we have to challenge that. And also, if you, if you want to build up learning societies, Learning economies. Uh, thank you. Uh, you need intensive collaboration. If you have property rights and intellectual property, that's not going to happen. So the challenge is also how to get knowledge and technology um, as public goods. Um, we think that that's the reason why you need to create technology for social inclusion, not just for the poor, but for everyone. Thank you very much. presenter into my presentation to uh, make reference to uh, cooking technology or renewable energy for uh, cooking in, in local communities because that's exactly what my colleagues and I have been looking at for the last couple of years. We've become increasingly interested in the dynamics and drivers of decision making at the very local level when it comes to choice of household fuels and stoves. Um, and why is that? Why, why, why is this an interesting question for us? Well, obviously, the driver, the key motivator for this research is improving livelihoods and reducing the environmental, negative environmental impacts of the reliance on um, traditional bioenergy for cooking. Um, also, the links to, to health, obviously, and the, the livelihood impact of the over-reliance on, on traditional use of bioenergy for cooking. At the same time, um, gaps that we and our partners have identified in the literature um, in understanding drivers and dynamics of decision making, uh, often we see sort of an overemphasis on um, socioeconomic factors such as income for explaining away uh, why households make certain choices. There's this sort of assumption that poor households will, will use any sort of um, cooking stove just because it's cheap or it's, uh, it's given away free or something like that. So we're sort of challenging this, that there's a need to sort of view these households as con consumers um, making trade-offs when they're making these sorts of decisions. At the same time, recently, in just the last couple of years, there's some really large uh, household energy programs taking off in different parts of the world. India is a good example of one where they're looking to really scale up uh, next generation cook stoves, extremely advanced technologies, 
several steps away from what people are currently using. Um, and many of these technologies you see are developed in, in laboratories without very much uh, user participation in the, the technology development. Uh, and then they're pilot tested and, and perhaps modified, but um, we've heard from our, our own partners in the field there's a lot of concern about this particular approach to developing technology. So at SCI, my colleagues and I have been looking at developing and prototyping new methodologies to try to get at some of these issues, to try to understand the key driving forces uh, influencing household decision making. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of approaches that we've been taking and uh, the sort of storyline so far. So this is just to uh, sort of, it's what Lawrence mentioned earlier, that 2.6 plus billion people in the world rely on uh, traditional use of biomass for cooking. This is what the map looks like. 60% um, of this concentrated in India and Sub-Saharan Africa, I would say, and the trends look like this will continue uh, if we follow business as usual over the next 10 years or so. Um, at the same time, there's more and more research to suggest that there are significant gains to be made um, in terms of climate and environment in addressing household energy in these regions. Um, this illustration here shows black carbon concentrations um, over South Asia. On the left, you see that this is what, if we take all of the sources of black carbon, including fossil, and agricultural burning and biofuel from cooking. Uh, this is what it looks like. And then the other illustration shows if you were to take away just biofuel cooking, the, the total uh, black carbon concentrations decrease significantly. This is a simulation from Romana and Carmichael. But how to tackle this very complex problem? These There have been efforts over the last 30, 40 years to try to uh, shift households and communities away from this traditional use of biomass, but it's, we haven't really seen any clear success stories. Recent research from UNEPS telling us that, in fact, to see any major climate impact, we're going to need to not only move people to more efficient, improved cook stoves, but in fact to move people completely away from uh, the traditional use of biomass for cooking, either to cleaner fuels, um, or to these so-called next generation cook stoves, which completely, uh, which combust completely and emit zero um, in terms of particulate matter. So we're talking about a major step away from uh, what people are currently using. So how do we get there? Um, and what sort of information do our partners and policymakers need in order to make informed decisions and um, about how to, how to support a transition like this, a huge transition. So again, in speaking with our, our stakeholders and partners, uh, firstly in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a few years back we started with um, developing a sort of quantitative model for understanding how households um, make trade-offs when they're trying to decide between different uh, modes of cooking, different stoves and different fuels. Um, we designed a choice experiment, a state of preference survey, that we ran three case studies in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, and in Mozambique, um, where essentially we asked households to make a series of decisions, uh, choices between different cookstoves with different attributes, such as the cost of the fuel, the running cost of the stove, how smoky the stove was, um, so very sort of product specific factors. We then took that data and, and plugged it into a model, which we were able to then use to, um, to, to make market projections in each of the cases, given uh, certain um, conditions, market conditions. For example, if the government of Ethiopia were to tomorrow remove completely the subsidy on kerosene, um, what would that mean for um, would households then be able to switch to clean fuels such as ethanol and would they purchase ethanol cook stoves and if so what price would the fuel of the stove need to be and so on. So it's very fine grained information that's, that's needed and we found this model very useful for generating that. Um, 
but the one was <laughs> criticized for being too quantitative and for losing a lot of the very important qualitative uh, softer data um, that the parameters were imputed into the model by the researchers and weren't where were they coming from. So in response to that, we've been looking more into generative methods, more qualitative, open-ended sort of uh, methods to try to complement this very uh, good model that we have already. So we carried out some research last year in northern India and Haryana State, where we conducted semi-structured interviews with open-ended questions and observations, uh, the result of which was a huge amount of data, which we then managed to categorize uh, into barriers, barriers and incentives for households to switch to alternatives, which then we were able to take and extract uh, a set of design parameters, essentially a design brief for a cooking stove, if you, if you will. So far, it uh, seems to be of interest to the Indian government and to others globally. This is a question that many different groups are trying to, are, are grappling with at the moment, uh, not least the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, the Hillary Clinton Initiative. Um, and the next step in our research will be to, to link up the quantitative and the qualitative uh, methodologies and to go back to India and, and try this out sometime next year. tell a story which is based in Nepal about people who currently have arsenic in the water and face clearly two challenges. How to get the arsenic out of the water but also importantly for this story I'm going to tell how to sense accurately and cheaply enough the amount of arsenic that currently is in the water. But first of all I think I need to go back to think about technology and what it does for us. So I just have a few pictures that I'm going to show you whilst I talk. But I think first of all, we need to appreciate that what I'm saying essentially is one potential pathway as we picked up from Step Center. So I'm not saying this is necessarily the right way, but the pathway I have followed in this story essentially is one of design. So I'm actively participating with a range of stakeholders in a design process. So that's the essence of uh, the story. It's based, I think, on the story so far being one of technology push. What have new technologies done for society and the globe? Somebody yesterday, eloquently from the floor, said, iPad 5 and iPad 6 will not solve the world's problems. And if I was to ask you, I think, interactively, to name a technology company that preeminently used design as a process. We probably all think of Apple. What I want to do though is turn that design process on its head, as it were, and talk much more about user-centered design rather than technology push design. So here we have examples of technology actually fulfilling our needs. But more often than that, actually it's market-driven. Market-driven approaches result in this picture on the right, perhaps. It also results in people doing things with technology that the designers never even thought of, never even imagined that we could or should do with that technology. And this is my favorite example of a technology that has been used or abused, should I say, for ends which the designers never thought of. We've all had that kind of similar example. Here's a very complex side in seven minutes, I can't possibly explain it. But the essence of what I'm trying to do is in that inverted triangle. So taking just very simply those three words involve, innovate, and inform, that's the basis of the model. And I'm taking the story on from my colleague Lawrence Goodzer. We, back in 2005, I think it was, were in that Harari workshop that Lawrence has already described and discussed with you. The problem, of course, is at the end of that workshop, nothing happened. That was very sad for me, an extremely sad day that there was no take-up. So that's the dialogue. What I then moved on to do, try to do was get the engagement. And in Peru, we ran a series of workshops where we did get the engagement of, of, of scientists, and we set up uh, a nanotechnology Andean network, not just within Peru, but in the whole of the Andean countries. That was fine again, but really we need to move on to developing, designing, 
things, products, technologies that will really help solve some of the world's key problems. So going on towards that story of delivery is really my message today. And essentially, what I see here as the problem agent is the nux of the story that I'm trying to outline to you today in terms of developing an arsenic sensor for Nepal. In 2009, I received some money from the Body Shop Foundation to run a workshop in Nepal. Now, you could say cynically, I'm just simply repeating what we did and had failed in Harare. We had some eminent nanotechnologists in that workshop flown over from Cambridge University. That's great. But then, so what? And I'm really interested in this so what questions because we can't just say, yes, that was great, having a talking shop. It has to be much more than that. And at that time, I was living in Nepal. I was there for six months working in our office. I was totally committed to trying to move things forward beyond that dialogue stage. So how did we do that? I then got secondment to DFID, and as part of that was running a program on emerging technologies. Not much funding is actually given for emerging technologies, probably for the reasons we've already outlined, that in, in essence the technology push model doesn't work. What I was trying to do was turn things on the head and basically develop design processes from the ground up involving stakeholders. With nanotechnologies again, from Cambridge, we put in a bit to DFID for some money and failed. So again, part of this story is about determination, about learning from the failure, owning up to that, and then getting to the next stage, picking yourself up and going forward. Essentially, what we have now done is form a multidisciplinary team across many different countries, especially if you include Scotland as an independent country. Okay. What am I saying here? Essentially, we now do have £600,000 from the Wellcome Trust to develop an arsenic sensor in Nepal. We have three years to do it. How are we going to do it? Essentially, we're going to do it following that model, involving people, involving all the stakeholders, building on some of the design criteria we developed within that workshop. A very small example of which is, I was sat next to the nanotechnologist, and he whispered in my ear at one point, David, I didn't realize that we're going to have to develop something that was high in at 65 degrees C. Now, you might think that that's very self-evident, working in Nepal or working in India, but to a white-coated nanotechnologist from Cambridge, it clearly wasn't self-evident. Just those very simple design criteria surfacing in those workshops are preeminently important in that design process, and we have to capture those at the beginning. So we're capturing and working with them as we go forward. We're working with all these stakeholders, which you can read for yourself. But the point is that we're able to do this over a three-year period. The point is we're not working with nanotechnologists, which originally was the idea. You might say, why not? I think essentially it's a question of timing. The nanotechnologists advised me it was going to take longer than we had in order to develop that technology. The synthetic biologists at Cambridge had already proven an idea and won an award for that idea at MIT in a competitive environment. So in other words, they've proven by bench testing this idea that it worked in the laboratory. But you probably also heard the word synthetic biology and the suit amongst you will therefore realize there are risks, there are regulation issues, and we aim to hit those absolutely head on, absolutely transparently. We have as members of the team people who have experience on regulatory issues we will be talking to government agencies, we will be talking to laboratories, and we will step very carefully through that process to make sure the risk is minimized for people and for the environment. So my model is this, and we're trying to engage therefore these top, these four uh, circles at the bottom, the local and the global scientists, the local and the global businesses, in order to make this a sustainable initiative that really can deliver value, public value from science, delivered through an innovative design process.